Critical Blast. Where pop culture gets blasted. And good evening again, everybody. I am RJ Carter, Senior Managing Editor here at CriticalBlast.com. And we have a very special guest with us tonight. Uh, I know normally you're used to talking about the geek culture and the superheroes and who's got what comic book coming out and what's going to be the next big movie. We're going to talk television. We're going to talk streaming. And tonight, uh, we would like you to welcome to the show uh, Ms. Crystal Hunt, who is starring on Pure Flix's uh, new series, Mood Swings. Crystal, how are you doing tonight? Streaming series, yes. Um, I'm doing good. I'm actually in Florida right now for my father's birthday this week. Well, happy birthday Thank doing you. for my us. My mother last week and my dad this coming, this, this week. So it's a busy month. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I can understand that. Um, I'm I've, always ready for August to be over because it's like <laughs> you always have to be so sneaky with planning things because I'm like, oh, I don't want anything big this year. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to. It's like, okay, you know, I'm going to do it anyway. So you've got to be able to get a breath before energy. Thanksgiving and Christmas. Exactly. Because it's huge here. We have we have a, a huge family. So Thanksgiving and Christmas are big undertakings, too. But um, yeah. but yeah, yeah. Um, I actually created and wrote an executive produce and started Moon Swings. So yeah, you've been very yeah, on hands with hands on with this. One. <laughs> it was it was tiring. I was looking forward to going to bed at night, but I only I don't think I ever got more than three hours each night. So everyone's like, "How are you running still?" Um, but it was so rewarding. It really was. Now, is there any well? I was going to ask on the actress side of things, uh, but since you're in the producing and maybe you wouldn't know what the difference might be, um, or maybe you would notice the difference even more, uh, a difference between doing what would be appointment television, which is what, you know, something like Guiding Light or One Life to Live would be, where you do it every day and you tune in every day versus streaming, uh, where here it is and it just all drops and, and you can binge the whole thing. Well, mine didn't actually, um, there was a big debate over this and I wanted them to, they actually started with our show, um, where they released each episode one a week versus dropping them all like they do on Netflix. Okay. So I was excited about that. A more traditional approach. Right. Cause to me, it drives me nuts when I have to wait till the next week, but I, feel like that's kind of the exciting part about it is you have that week of suspense. Um, you know, my father, he's not a huge like fan of mini series. He doesn't really like get hooked, but he is hooked on Yellowstone and Sunday nights, there better not be any commotion or anybody talking about anything else because that's his night. And that's the only night he asks to be able to watch his show. And it's so funny to even see him be like, so, like entranced into something, but he is. Um, and uh, I get it, you know, it, it, I, I think there's something to be said about that week of suspense, like, oh, why they have to end it there? <laughs> like, yeah. bleeding's gonna happen at the beginning of the next episode, you know? Yeah, he, he and I probably come from the same era of television where you had to wait a week, plus you had to be in front of the TV at seven o'clock because if you weren't, you, couldn't you missed it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and we're so spoiled now we can get DVDs and just sit down for an afternoon and just watch an entire series. It's very true. Or Apple TV. Yeah. So you are producing this one. This is your baby. This is your idea. Uh, what, what drove you to want to do this kind of, of, of a project? I mean, not just comedy, but uh, the, the family oriented comedy that it is. I mean, I think there's always something to writing a comedy, especially an adult comedy too that has has you know little ones in it as well but writing it in a way where there are beats that the adults will get but the kids it'll sail over their heads which is a sure. good thing um and that was sort of something special i feel like they really did well when i was a kid because when you watch some of the movies that your parents let you watch as a kid now you're like Oh my gosh, now I get why my parents were laughing at so many parts. I had no idea what they were talking about. I was like, why is that funny? 
Um, so I felt like that was a challenge, which I thought was, I love challenges. Um, but the main reason why I wanted to do this, like do a modern, my own little modern twist on the Golden Girls is because well, I, I love the Golden Girls, but also, um, you know, it's really hard once you've done dramas for a substantial part of your career. And this is a conversation that Donna Mills and I had when we were doing Queens of Drama. Um, you almost have to convince people or remind people that you can actually be funny too. So that was really my main motivation behind it. It was like, there's nothing like this in the breakdowns. There's nothing like this coming up. Like, I guess we just have to make it. Yeah. Now, now you mentioned the Golden Girls as being an inspiration. I definitely see um, the parallels. I mean, it's, it's four women living in the same house. Uh, I was getting more of a of a Fuller House vibe or even a, a Designing Women vibe, if you want to go back to that era. There's some uh, of those notes, for sure. I think it, yeah. it all kind of stems from the fact that in our family, it is so normal and not remotely strange that, you know, my sister has a 12 year old and she has a 30 year old lawyer that's pregnant with her for her baby. Um, my sister was getting ready to go to prom when she found out that mom was pregnant with me. So there's huge, huge gaps amongst all of us in our family. So it's not, it, it's not something that's common, but I gotta say, when you put all of those females together into one household or to one, you know, uh, set, you know, those different ages, it causes for fun on its own. Like that you don't even have to write. And I think that that's kind of one thing I wanted to have is, as I know how much fun it is having each decade, because there's so many different levels and lack of estrogen amongst each, each uh, decade. Yeah. And, and you do have quite the uh, diverse cast of co-stars there uh, in, in that, you know, you've got, with Golden Girls again, they were all retired women. Uh, yeah. Here you've got, you know, people from Robin Riker down to um, Christina DeRosa and Sophia Gasca. So it's like a different generation, each one. Uh, and, and you're there having to tie them all together and, and run herd on this uh, roommate situation in, in this mansion that, exactly. that Farrah is trying to hold down on. Uh, and that's the exact dynamic that is our family, all of those ages always together. And it's not weird. Like Donna Mills is one of my best girlfriends. I mean, so it's not a stretch. Like, um, I was going to ask how you landed her on this, uh, on this show. Well, I wrote the role for her. Um, we were doing, I, I, I had already played her daughter like three times before that. Um, but we met on Queens of Drama and I wrote the treatment for the series on Queens of Drama and she loved it. And um, I said, I was like, well, okay, well, I think we should do it. She's like, yeah. She's like, I mean, I haven't done comedy in a while. And it, 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 I'm sure you've experienced the same thing once you do drama. It's almost like you have to really prove yourself. I'm like, you do not. You're, you're preaching to the choir. I'm well aware. <laughs> so, well, I've got the uh, YouTube promo here. I'm just going to run this real quick so we can kind of see, show our audiences here exactly uh, you know what they're in for when they sign up for the pure flick streaming service i'm just gonna yeah. play this real quick All right, so that's, you know, it's got a nice upbeat uh, musical tone to it there. And you can see there's a lot of comical action going on. I can't help but smile every time I see that pool montage because I've known Donna for years and I didn't know until like moments before we shot that, that she didn't know how to swim. I'm like. Oh, <laughs> that could have been how, unintentionally how tragic. How do I not know this, A, and B, you had the script longer than anyone. like. When were you gonna tell me this? Well, maybe she figured it was like a four foot pool. You stand up in it and you're fine. Yeah, well, we did we did jump into the midsection. because I told her, I said, you can get hurt more so in the shallow end. 
I'd say if we're jumping in the middle of the, in between the deep end and the shallow end's the way to go. There you go. As um, a Florida kid, you know, we were fish. Now, one of the things, you know, I, I just mentioned the, the, the theme song music that plays on that, mm -hmm. but as you watch the show, one of the places where mood swings will differ from something that's on more of a network sitcom situation is that you don't have the ambient music playing into the scenes uh, and you don't have a laugh track. Uh, was that a, a conscious decision? I'm not a fan of laugh tracks. You know, I like when there's a live studio audience because you get to, you like, I imagine the energy, like you feed off of it, almost like theater. Jane, it's something that you really get to feed off of. The Golden Girls got a live audience, so it's like, it's different. You get the energy of human bodies and seeing if what, you, however you played something, if that worked better, if it, or if there's things that you didn't find funny that end up like getting a lot of laughs that you never expected. Sure. There's something to be said about that. And I've always been a fan of Curb Your Enthusiasm. So to me, I really liked kind of the way it just felt real um, and not so like uh, sort of overlit and staged. Do you know what I mean? I kind of like the real kind of feel of it. Almost like single camera, but without the oh, I feel like I'm going to be nauseous and I need to take like Dramamine so I don't, you know, get motion sickness kind of thing. Right. Because some of that, some of the, you know, handheld stuff can get a little wobbly. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of the handheld and I've I've done plenty of interviews with handheld um, Yeah. doing the camera thing. In fact, I did, um, <laughs> gosh, it was over a year and a half. I, I've lost track of time with all this COVID stuff going on. Yeah, <laughs> bleeding me, we all have. You're not the only but, one. But I was privileged to do an interview with Margaret O'Brien when she came to St. Louis uh, for the Meet Me in St. Louis tour. And I'm in line and it's like, here, here's one TV station with the boom mics and the and the big cameras and and one after the other. And then I sit down next to her. She's like, where's your camera? I'm like, it's on the counter over there on that little tripod with somebody getting ready to press the button. And she's like, seriously? And, and fortunately, Ben Mankovics was there from uh, you know classic movies and he's like, no, Margaret, they're all, like all doing it now this day. There's movie producers making entire films on these iPhones. She's like, oh, oh that's interesting. It's now, true. But, but you do, um, yeah, with a live audience, you actually get a different kind of sound quality too, I think, from from the people on the set because it's open in front of you. Yeah, you do. So, But it definitely needs you, the sound and also it, it requires far more budget because then you have to shoot on the sound stage. So it's going to have a different look. You're not going to get natural lighting. It's all going to be set like lighting. You know, it's all going to be, you know, there's going to be a grid above yeah. you with lights already preset. And it's a whole different thing. You know, it's a whole different animal, especially when you're shooting on a uh, lower budget than, say, network television. Right. Um, so are you on a soundstage or are you in a house? We shot every single thing on location at one home. Okay. Um, not I, your home, so. That's nuts. That was nuts. Like, when the director goes, every set you're going to be able to do, I was like, I know it sounds crazy, but I already looked at it once, and I have it all figured out, and I already have everything in my Amazon cart on how we can make it look. And he's like, okay. I, I mean, it's probably not going to happen, but... I, I'm open to hearing what your thoughts are. And he's like, he had some choice words to say. He was just like, holy big music. All right, I'm wrong. I eat my words. He's like, I don't know how you found this place. So so you're, you're, if I'm understanding you correctly here, it's not just that the kitchen and the living room sets are in the same house, but so are the principal's office and Dr. Sitwell's office in the same house. I'm gonna to have to go back and rewatch everything I just watched again to see what I can to find the tells. Um, yep. Because I, I've watched like five of the episodes this week, um, and and I haven't gone further into it yet because I can only watch. We only have one device on Pure Flix at a time, and when wow. I get, I'll get kicked off because I'll know my wife is upstairs in her room and she's turned it on, and I'm like, oh, I've been booted. <laughs> Someone <laughs> new has come on. Uh, but that's fine. She's enjoying it as much as I am. Oh, uh, I love that. So. But yeah, back to the laugh track thing. Yes. 
you know, the thing is when you're putting a laugh track in and it's not real humans there in the audience, I think you're really at the mercy of your editor as to where to put it, how long to put it, how, how, how loud, how much do you, it's like, to me, it just seems a little, sometimes people get carried away with it. Sometimes yeah. it's a little like, okay, you really loved your writing or you really loved your performance on that. Cause I don't, I, you know what I mean? Like I, I don't, I don't like when you watch something and you hear a laugh track, but you don't understand why what's funny in it. You're like, I really didn't think that was the funniest beat. True. Like, so to me, I'd rather let everybody else choose when they think it's funny. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it unless, gets added afterwards. So. That energy of a live performance. Right. With the live performance, you know, the actor knows to wait until it's died down. You can you get a different timing than you would with uh, say, OK, wait three seconds, assume the laugh track is over and start my dialogue back right. up again. Uh, and you and, and you can tell it's not natural. Too, because even like B. Arthur or like, you know, uh, Mer McClanahan, some of the lines like I would say almost every Betty White line, you almost knew like they had to wait for the applause and the laughter and whatnot after each uh sort of like as they say bubble-headed comment she would have she would say um but I, I it's funny because i'm sure the writers plan for that in writing as to like how much time they would have to plan out in an episode so how much they have to write for but what i love are the moments that they never expected to have those big beats of laughter where they're like even you can see the actors are like they're kind of, you know what I mean? Like they were ready to roll on into their next response, but yet it got a great response from the from the live audience. Yeah, and you just uh, you just change your pacing after that to make up the lost time if you have That's to. Well. Yep, or ad lib it as it needs to be done. Exactly. So I haven't seen yet uh, any episodes that have an individual focus yet. I mean, obviously it's Farrah's show. The focus should be and is on her for the first several episodes. But do we get to see anything that's going to let us know the roommates a little bit closer with more of a, a focused spotlight? Every single episode, every single roommate has an episode, basically where you get to delve into their world. So it really, so I wrote this with one of the writers of the Golden Girls. So um, I have no, you know, experience writing so it it really was more of i've known him since a very very long time since i was like a teenager and i just think he is unbelievable at comedy so i put all my faith in in him to be like I, I will help you generate some content with one of my girlfriends give you some girl material as long as we can all structure a good beat board and be on the same like outline but um you know, you know how to do this far better than we do. We'll just be your makeshift writer's room in a way. And, you know, I think that that was the key is, is making sure, and he made me very aware of this, is it's very important when you're introducing all these characters that people don't know from Adam, you need to make sure you have an episode where you at least dive into that character's background to, give a little bit of like a, give everybody an opportunity to make their own uh, judgment as to who that person is or what kind of person they are, but then actually show the people who, the, what makes these people tick, so to speak. Right. I mean, we, we get, you know, a good general sense of them in every episode. Uh, with, but, you know, with, with Danny, you're always going to have a Lorenzo story coming yeah, out. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's just, and it's just like, you know, on the Golden Girls, it's so it was Saint Olaf. It's like her Saint Olaf story. Yes, exactly. Or, or picture it, Sicily. You know what I mean? It's like she's always got a story. I'm still trying to um, wrap, un unravel the mystery that is Amelia because she's always getting a package from some foreign agent. Say, my guess is that you're hinting toward Amelia because we yep. make her extremely like up in the air throughout the first like six episodes you're not going to find out her backstory until i'm almost positive it's eight okay i'm not that far yet but i'll get there and then you'll find the backstory on danny in seven. 
okay. And she's, yeah, she's the one with all the Lorenzo stories um, that nobody wants to hear because apparently they've already heard enough of them. Exactly. Well, that's, that's the thing. I had to have somebody to be the Rose, the, the like, you know, and St. Olaf and everyone's just like, okay, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> like, bite my arm off so I can get out of here. And, and I guess Coco then would be the Rue McClanahan of the set. You got it. Because she she's the, you know, I've got to dress nice. I've got to squeeze into this dress. I've got to land this man. Um, Very good. So so that brings me to Angel and what his uh, role is in the caster. Because he, he, he just kind of seems to, to live there. And um, I don't quite know what else. Yet. He, he kind of is a... The, the handyman who's not handy at all. Yeah, he's the comic relief in a situation comedy. Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, I I always grew up like one of the boys. Like, don't get me wrong, I'm as girly as they come too, but I've always been a tomboy. So I think that's kind of why I was like, well, it would be like me if I had my best friend. Like, even if he sucked at what he did, I'd still try to help him out and like give him a job. And like, even if everything wasn't perfect, like, at least you can trust him and, you know, you can trust him around your child and your child loves him. He's like family. You've known him forever. And also it adds a little bit of like comic relief too in there, but from a male perspective, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like from a male end of things, which, because that's another thing is that I didn't, I wanted to add enough, like at least a little bit of guy stuff in there, even if it's, predominantly female so that guys weren't like okay the moment my wife turns this on i'm gonna exit the room do you know what I mean at least they see enough guy stuff going on or of guys on the screen to at least maybe sit through it oh and yeah well you out they might find it interesting you, you've definitely got the uh delivery man mark uh brock kukna kushna kushna oh, yeah kushna and, uh, you know, ex-husband Jonathan is mm -hmm. always uh, just kind of walking through the front door because he apparently still has a key. Uh, I, I think there's probably a story coming out, of, if it's not in this season, maybe next season, uh, about Angel and why he's there. Uh, not just because he's best friend, but one presumes he wasn't living there before the divorce went through. <laughs> so. Oh, he always lived in the guest house. Oh, he did. OK, so he, he's the um, he, he's the Cato Kalen of the family then. Exactly. Yeah. Out in that guest house. Got Something it. Something like that. Yeah. All right. So there's one season already um, done, complete, or is or is it still being? I, I haven't scrolled through the end to know if it's a finished season or not. It's finished. It's finished season. Uh, any plans for a second season and what we might? Uh... I would love to. Yeah. I um I just waiting for people from the network to actually get back work <laughs> it's yeah that's so, a... it's so odd right now like i just don't even um you know my best friend just got flown to new zealand to start this new series uh there because they figured they'd shoot, shoot there because uh, you know they're i guess they have the lowest amount of covid cases but then she landed there and next thing you know the cases went up and oh, now they put yeah. back shooting a couple weeks. So she's like, okay, I got to do something. I'm, I got to figure out something to do in New Zealand. Okay. So, um, so and exactly how in LA, imagine LA, LA really is, isn't past like the whole curbside pickup thing. So it, it's still very, you know, behind. So I, yeah. I, it's going to be, it's, a, it's, I'll be curious to see when like, you know, new production starts really picking up again. Now, how involved are, uh, are David and Andrea White in this uh, production? Do you see them often or are they just kind of like, you know, you call them if something goes wrong? Well, Andrea was in the show. Okay, I haven't noticed her. I've, I've, I've interviewed her. I know what she looks like, so <laughs> I just haven't seen her yet. She's the, she's the mean mom. Oh my God, that's a great makeup job because that is not how she looked in um, Mom's Night Out. Yeah, I we came up with a whole look for her and I thought it was really good. Um, but yeah, and this is, I, I don't know, I thought she did a really great job in it. Yeah, like, that's, that's a great character. Mom. And um, David, yeah, he pops by when he's like, he's like, he's like uh, Scott Bailey's character, like Jonathan. 
he just like pops in when you're in the middle of doing something and you're like oh hey <laughs> all right where are you going but like this all happened just because david white said whatever happened to that treatment that you pitched on queens of drama I'm like the modern modern golden girls one he's like yeah what was it called I'm like mood swings yeah what happened did you really do anything with that i'm like i haven't i was kind of you know busy doing two seasons uh of a show with you guys um so i hadn't really gotten around to it yet but he's like can you give me like a rough pitch i'm like sure yeah and i did and he's like all right cool let's do eight episodes well, it's good when they come to you for it and you don't have to take it to them. That's Well, I was there to negotiate my deal for the next season of the other show. So that's what was kind of like, my head was in that space, not in like pitch mode. Like, okay, I'm a little salesman today. You know what I mean? It was totally not there. But don't worry, I found my gear. Went right back into it. But, Perfect. Um, Perfect. you know, it, it was just funny because I'm like, all right. So everyone's like, how many, so how many episodes do you have written yet? Like, can I read like the rough draft? I'm like, I only have a treatment. <laughs> I don't have episodes yet. Uh, when we wrap this, this second season of the show that I'm doing with them, I'm like, the next day I have to start writing it. So what, what, what is it like sitting down to write a sitcom then? I mean, you, you did come out of daily drama. You know what a script looks like and how they're supposed to be, you know, interpreted. Um, yeah. Were you sitting on this idea for a long time? And it's totally different, though. Like it's totally different because you you don't realize until you're, you know. First of all, soaps are an hour. Most of them are. They're somewhere half hour. But it's very easy to sort of go off on bunny trails when you're writing comedy because you just find it funny, and it's like you realize, yeah, that is funny, but you have to worry about telling all the story that you have to tell in this one episode. So if you can tell the entire story and then still can go back and have time for that bunny trail, awesome. But plan to not have that time first. Yeah. First, make sure every bit of like content that needs to be covered in this episode is covered too while making it funny. And, and I guess, um, Part of making it funny was making sure that Farah's new job was as a completely inexperienced assistant at a proctologist office. I mean, because because proctology is funny. I mean, it's it just is. The yeah. occupation of in and of itself allows for humor. Exactly, and 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 the fact that the doctor has no sense of humor, or at least no recognition of the humor in it. Uh, that he doesn't even get that it's funny that his name is Sitwell and he's a proctologist. He's like. What's so funny about it? I, I don't get it. It's, it's just, there's something <laughs> funny about that. I agree. Now those scenes, we shot them as written, all the well ones, because um, Brian Palermo is actually one of the heads of Groundlings. So as you know, that's kind of how a lot of the SNL people yes. started, ground, either Groundlings or UCB theater. Um, I did UCB in New York, but uh, they're kind of the same. I've always loved improv. So we did them as written like two times through, and then all the other takes were all improvisational, like every bit of it. And the director thought he was gonna, cause he knew Brian. So he knew, he thought for sure I was gonna get stumped by him. And he was worried, he's like, you held your own the entire time. He's like, he didn't like stump you one time. I, I just, I never, I didn't even think so people knew how to do that. I'm like, see, this is a stereotype. I'm like, I happened to get my first job and second job on soaps, but I trained forever beforehand and during and love improv. Like improv is my favorite. See now, and that's one of the things that I've always respected soap opera actor, soap actors for it's hard to spit some of these words out uh sometimes uh in, in that you know every other show that's not a soap you see you you, you know they film uh, you know as many as they can and then they start releasing once a week with soaps it's every day there's no break i'm like they have to learn these lines 
very quickly and get in you know touch with where the storyline is headed and and make quick shifts in direction. Joan Collins said we're the hardest working actors in the business. I, I can't uh, argue with that at all because it, there, there's no break. You guys are putting out Christmas episodes and they come out on Christmas Day and there, there's no there's no break. But um, there's a lot of it's you shoot a lot in advance, like way in advance. So you're shooting like way out of order. So you're shooting like, you know, one to two episodes, if not, you know, part of a third in a day. Yeah, I think you'd have to. Based on what sets are up, you know. So I would say a big day on Guiding Light would be like 30 or so pages, 40 pages max, I'd say. But I, it was a pretty regular occurrence on One Life to Live to do anywhere from 60 to 80. Frank Valentini, is a, he's a machine. He just, he knows how to power through those days. I, it's, I'm, I am beyond impressed with his skills, which he's now taken over to GH. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, I was going to say a lot of the soaps have um, done the unthinkable and ended. Uh, I know it's crazy. Yeah, and and you know when they start, some of them started in radio and they're continuing. Guiding Light did. Guiding Light yeah. was the first television show on the air. They were the first people to go. Let's all right, let's try this whole radio thing. I mean, this whole TV thing, and see how it goes. We've been doing the radio, the fifteen-minute little segments uh, to talk about ivory soap. You know, hence why. Okay. Soap operas. Yeah, if I think a lot of people um, don't know that if they don't uh, have a knowledge of the classic radio history, that that's yeah. that that's why everything exists on television is to advertise what's coming up uh, <laughs> and to make you stick around for the next ad. Exactly. I was going to ask another question, but now I can't remember what it was. So it must not have, must not have been that important. I got derailed on talking about soap operas, and that's you know, I working from home. Uh, this isn't my first time having to do so. I've been stuck uh, having to go back to work and all of a sudden wondering, is Victor Newman going to survive his hospital uh, surgery? As I'm, cause, because it's going on in front of me here as I'm going and, and trying to work. Um, they're, they're addictive. They, they, will, they will drag you in. And I, I always told my wife, there's like, there's, I didn't always tell my wife, I don't talk about soaps all the time. But, I should say, is this the nightly conversation? Yeah, it's, it's not. It, it, it's a regular conversation, though. The thing about soaps is that if there's a dinner to be had or a Christmas party to be had, it will go on for three months and you're still oh, at the same dinner. Without a doubt. That, but, without saying, yes, it's very true. That's but conversely, why, that's if you have a baby. Want, or like a wedding, too, in terms of oh. wedding, because like when they, when they pay for those sets, they're specially made, so they're going to get their use out of them, which is why when you see like the pretty, beautiful, elaborate wedding cakes in the sets, if you would see the back of them, the actors have like devoured the whole back. It looks like a bunch of rats have gotten to it, but we only do that for the first couple of days because the next like few weeks the set's up, and everyone's like, it's no, it's been there too long, <laughs> but it was really good when it was fresh. Well, and, and then conversely, if you if somebody has a baby on the show, three months later, he's in military school or he's gay. Well, that's true. But you know what's so funny? Because I was, when on One Life to Live, they had Stacy get pregnant and then she miscarried and then she had to try to get pregnant again and did. I'm not kidding you. I was wearing, I, I was had I was having to like actually get on a scale. I'm like, I need to make sure I don't put on weight because... I'm wearing these maternity pants every day and it's coming up on like six months for me. I'm like, this is nuts. I, I could have almost had a real baby by the time they get me out of this stuff. <laughs> it was crazy. I'm like, usually pregnancies are like this. They're so quick. And yes, then they're cheated and all of a sudden, whoop, they're grown up. Yeah. And uh, I have no idea how many generations, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to say Victor Newman because, you know, YNR is what was always on in the house. I have no many gener no idea how many generations under him there are now because of this way that time flows in a soap. Uh, right. he, he's got to be a great grandfather by now and still looking like he could kick my butt in a fist fight. <laughs> so he, he's in great shape. Uh, a lot of them are. Well, that is, of course, not the point that we brought you on here for. We wanted to talk about uh, mood swings and, and we have, but I want to end with that as well and remind people 
uh, in the chat who are watching us live here that if you look at the description below, you will see the link to the Pure Flix site where you can sign up for the monthly streaming service at $12.99 a month, uh, where you will have access to not just Mood Swings, but many, many other series. It's like Netflix, but you don't have to worry what your kids are going to click on if you leave the room. That's what I say. It's one thing you can just give them free reign. Yes, we, we, we have Netflix and I've come back and said, I know I did not watch Child's Play and you are only 12. So <laughs> I hear you. So I, I am, you know, and my wife is the same way. She definitely worries about um, what gets put onto the television when we're not around. Uh, Netflix is. Because kids, kids know how to work that stuff better than we do. And even yeah. you know, anybody else. I mean, it's crazy. Oh, yeah. My, I gave my son the phone to play a Candy Crush game. And the next thing I know, there's like five other games on here. And Siri is calling me a different name. I'm like, how did you get it to do that? He's like, it's easy. You just swipe these things around. I'm, okay, <laughs> never mind. I love it. <laughs> so anyway, Crystal, thank yeah. you so much for coming on. We do appreciate your time. Um, thank thanks you for what you're doing on Mood Swings. Thank you. And if you're on Instagram, catch me at Crystal underscore Hunt. And that's also your Twitter handle, where where you don't spend a lot of time, and that's smart. <laughs> Twitter you know will what? I don't. It's terrible. <gasps> Definitely hit her up on Instagram. Um, follow her on Twitter in case she puts something up there, crystal underscore hunt. And we're going to end with that. Thank you so much for being